Welcome to our online service for this middle Sunday in August. Whether you are joining us from home or if you've managed to get away for a bit of a break and are joining us from elsewhere, it is really great to have you with us. Today is the last in our current series looking at some of Paul's letters and we're very grateful to the Reverend Ed Kaneen who is co-principal of the local Baptist College and also a member here at Ararat and will be opening up Paul's letter to Philemon a bit later. But first we're going to begin with our psalm for today, which is one of 15 psalms known as Songs of Ascent, which would have been sung by Hebrew pilgrims on their way to Jerusalem. It's only very short, in fact it has just three verses, but they are good words to hear, so let's read that now. How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. It is like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down on the collar of his robe. It is as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion, for there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. Shall we pray? Holy God, we gather to worship you and to reaffirm our shared relationship as your children. We come celebrating our unity, but we confess the many ways that we are often divided. Our nationality, ethnicity, economic status, gender, age and life preferences all too often obscure the common calling we share in Christ's name. But we're reminded in this psalm this morning how good a thing it is when all your people live together in unity. So may our common identity and our communal witness of the good news of the gospel bind us together in your name for the sake of your kingdom's glory. Amen. Thank you. 
So Rachel's having a well-deserved break this week and she's asked me if I'd talk to you. So I thought we'd think about fixing things. I wonder if you've ever managed to break anything. A plate, a window, or maybe you've even broken a part of you, like a leg or an arm. There are some things that are actually useful when they're broken, like an egg, which needs to be cracked open so we can make scrambled egg or mix it together and make other things like a cake. <laughs> or a Christmas cracker, which needs to be pulled apart to reveal the little toy and hat and joke. But most things that get broken need to be fixed in order to become useful again. And I've got the names of four different types of people here and I wonder if you can match them with the things they can help us to fix. Who would we need to go and see if we broke our arm? Have you got it? Yes, that's right, the doctor. Who would we need to call if our car broke down? Yes, you're right, we'd need a mechanic. What about if we needed help mending our roof? You're good at this, aren't you? Well done, yes, it's the builder. And last one, what about if you broke one of your toys? Who might be able to help you glue it back together again? Well, there's only one answer left now, so yes, you've got it. You could ask your mum or your dad to help. In today's Bible passage, we're going to read about someone else who is trying to help fix something. In his letter to Philemon, Paul is trying to help fix a broken relationship. You see, Philemon had a slave called Onesimus, and Onesimus had run away from Philemon, and it's possible he might have stolen something that belonged to him as well. But Onesimus ends up meeting Paul, who tells him the good news about Jesus, and as a result, Onesimus puts his trust in the Lord. Paul was pleased that Onesimus had found peace with God, but he knew he didn't have peace with Philemon. There was still a break in that relationship, so Paul writes to help make it possible for them to fix things between them. I wonder if you've ever fallen out with a friend, or maybe a brother or sister. When this happens, it's always good to try and mend the relationship. Now, do you remember the different people we thought about earlier? They all have particular tools to enable them to help fix things. The doctor might use some plaster to set a broken bone in place. The mechanic and the builders will have special tools that they use. And your mum and dad, well, they might use things like superglue or sellotape to mend things. And we too have tools we can use to help us mend our relationships. We have a heart which can help us to love others, even when we see things differently. We have a brain to help us think about what might have gone wrong and how we can make amends. And we have a mouth which we can use to say sorry for anything we might have done to upset someone. You can be a great fixer too if you use your special tools. And remember, we've always got God to help us if we just ask him. Let's pray. Father God, sometimes things go wrong and we can feel sad and unhappy. Thank you for people who fix things. When we are unhappy because a friendship or relationship is broken, Help us to remember to use our heart, our head and our mouths so that we can help fix things too. Amen. There are lots of things that are broken in our world, so we're going to continue in prayer as we bring some people, places and situations before God, the great restorer and healer. Loving God, we pray for our world. As we move through more days, more deaths, more recoveries, and more challenges created by the COVID-19 pandemic. We pray for each of the 188 countries known to be affected. And we pray particularly for India, as it has the highest number of daily cases and deaths. Latin America, the epicentre of the pandemic, according to the World Health Organization. And for Brazil, which has the second highest number of cases in the world after the US. We also pray for South Africa and Egypt, who have seen the largest outbreak so far, and for Spain, which has again reached a critical situation. We pray that you would reveal your presence to those who are grieving or anxious and in social isolation. Guide the researchers and medics towards a fuller understanding of this disease so that they can help provide the right interventions to stop this virus spreading 
and medications to help those who have contracted the virus. We pray for places around the world where there is political unrest and we think particularly of Hong Kong where the recent bursts of violence have pushed the city even further away from the possibility of any peaceful resolution. We pray for Belarus and all the protests sparked by a disputed election and the ongoing nightly protests in Portland following the death of George Floyd. Lord, we pray for peace, for justice and for hope to be released in these places. We pray for Beirut, Lebanon and all the Lebanese people as their communities are shaken by the after effects of the ammonium nitrate explosion. We pray that you'd hold the people close through their devastation and give strength to the rescue workers. We also want to lift to you those affected by the mudslide in India, those caught in the crossfire of violent battles in Mozambique. We ask that you'd be with those living through the emergence of deadly conflicts in Port Sudan. Bring your comfort, your power, your love where your children are crying out. And in all these situations, show us how to speak words of solidarity and how to take actions that make a difference. As we open our eyes to the world's needs, we pray that you would abide with all those whom we do not know by name, but who are known and loved by you. In our own country, we pray for all our young people who have just received exam results or who are waiting to hear this coming week. With the disruption of their education this year, we pray that the marks awarded would be fair and not hold anyone back. And where people feel wronged, we pray that the appeal system would give people a voice and that any injustice may be righted. Lord, so much is wrong in our world and there is so much more we could pray for. But we ask by the power of your Holy Spirit that you would continue to work in our world, bringing comfort and healing, mercy and grace. For we ask all these things in the precious name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen.
Shemai, it's a privilege to be part of this sermon series on three of Paul's prison letters, Philippians, Colossians, and today Philemon. As some of you may know, I've been doing some accompanying videos on these books of the Bible, and you can see them on the Ararat YouTube page. In the one on Philemon, there's material that I won't be covering in the sermon today. It's not often as a preacher that you get to preach on a whole book of the Bible or to have that read in the service. But here we go with Paul's shortest letter, the letter to Philemon. And as you listen to it, you might like to imagine the different characters. There's Paul, who's writing from prison, who clearly has such faith that he will be released and that God has a future ministry for him. Then there's Philemon, a friend of Paul's, a church leader and a slave owner. This letter is probably being read out to him in front of his church. And then there's Onesimus. He doesn't get a say, but the letter is about him. He is a slave of Philemon. He's become a Christian and he's probably bringing this letter from Paul to Philemon. My daughter Sarah is going to read it for us. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother. To Philemon, our dear friend and co-worker, to Apphia, our sister, to Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. When I remember you in my prayers, I always thank my God, because I hear of your love for all the saints and your faith toward the Lord Jesus. I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective when you perceive all the good that we may do for Christ. I have indeed received much joy and encouragement from your love, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, my brother. For this reason, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do your duty, yet I would rather appeal to you on the basis of love, and I, Paul, do this as an old man, and now also as a prisoner of Jesus Christ. I am appealing to you for my child, Onesimus, whose father I have become during my imprison imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful both to you and to me. I am sending him, that is, my own heart, back to you. I wanted to keep him with me so that he might be of service to me in your place during my imprisonment for the gospel, but I prefer to do nothing without your consent, in order that your good deed might be voluntary and not something forced. Perhaps this is the reason he was separated from you for a while, so that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother. Especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has wronged you in any way, or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I... Paul, I'm writing this with my own hand. I will repay it. I say nothing about your owing me, even your own self. Yes, brother, let me have this benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I am writing to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. One thing more, prepare a guest room for me, for I am hoping for your prayers to be restored to you. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends greetings to you. And so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Sarah. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for those who have passed it on down through the generations. 
We thank you for the way in which it teaches and challenges us to live for you today. May we hear its message, heed its message, and live for you. Amen. As you may know, I grew up in the Isle of Man, but I was actually born in Liverpool, where my parents were living at the time. But before I was two, they moved back to the Isle of Man when my paternal grandfather died. In spite of having a Manx surname, in spite of having a Manx father who was well known, in spite of having no memory of anything other than living in the Isle of Man, I was still from time to time bullied at school for being a come-over, as we were called, because I was not born there. You may have had similar experiences of not fitting in, perhaps if you were evacuated during the war. Perhaps if you didn't speak Welsh in a Welsh-speaking area, or if you did speak Welsh in an English-speaking area, or because of having a complicated family relationship. Have pity on Sir Paul Nurse. I don't know if you saw his story a couple of weeks ago, but he is the Nobel Prize-winning and former president of the Royal Society, who heads the Francis Crick Laboratory in London, investigating the secrets of DNA and human genetics. When he applied to work in the United States, he thought he had pretty good credentials, but he was turned down. And they said that they didn't like his birth certificate. He only had a short version which didn't name his parents, and had always been told that they'd done this to save money. And so he applied for a longer one and discovered, to his shock, that where his father's name should have been, there was just a line. Yet more shocking... Where his mother's name should have been was his sister's name. And he realised that throughout his childhood, the person who'd brought him up, whom he'd called Mum, was actually his grandmother. And she'd done it to cover up an illegitimate pregnancy in the woman whom he'd called Sister. He's 71 and so they're all dead now. But irony of ironies, it means that the man who works with DNA has now had to get a DNA test in order to try to work out his true identity. Well, this is the topic of the times we're living in, isn't it? While we will all remember this summer for the image of people wearing masks, I suspect we will also remember the images of the statue of the slave trader Edward Colston being pulled down in Bristol, and perhaps the short-lived replacement statue of the Black Lives Matter activist Jen Reed. Because the death of George Floyd reminded the whole world that racism has not gone away, and racism derives from our understanding of who I am and who you are. In other words, it is all about identity. And this short letter to Philemon, although it's often disregarded because it doesn't really contain any theology, it's hugely important because it too is all about identity. Gives us a snapshot of a domestic situation, one that would have had life-changing consequences for the person who was delivering Paul's letter to Philemon, uh, Onesimus. As verse 16 tells us, Onesimus was the slave of Philemon. And Philemon was probably a reasonably wealthy man because he had a church that met in his house, as verse 2 tells us. Therefore, he would probably have had a number of slaves, and Onesimus would be just one of them. It was perfectly normal in the Roman world for people to have slaves. Even poor families might well have a slave to help them with the work in the fields and in the home, just as Jesus' parable in Luke 17 indicates. But slavery was no less terrible than we imagine, and no one wanted to be a slave. In fact, ancient writers could talk about becoming a slave as equivalent to dying. And one of the reasons they did this was because when a person became a slave, they lost their identity. They lost who they were. You see, Anisimus would not have been his real name. Not the name he was given at birth. We don't know what his birth name actually was. All we know is the name that he was given by Philemon when Philemon took ownership of him. Because it was common for slave owners to give names to their slaves to indicate their hopes for their slaves. A common name, for example, was Felix, which means lucky. Anisimus means useful. And it was clearly Philemon's hope that this slave would prove to be useful. 
It's why Paul can make a joke about this in verse 11 and his hope that now that Onesimus has become a Christian, he will prove to be useful. He will prove to live up to his name. But the consequence of giving a slave a new name is that it reminded the slave that who they are is now determined by their new owner. Their old identity no longer mattered. Their old self had died. I mean, a birth name. It will often indicate where a person is from. David from Wales. Francois from France. Gilda from Germany. Brad from the United States. But any connection to a place of birth that Anisimus might have had has been taken away from him. Perhaps he didn't even know where he came from. Well, it didn't matter, because his identity was now determined by his owner. Well, you might be already drawing a kind of positive Christian parallel to this, but I don't want to go there, because actually it's a terrible thing to take away someone's identity. Love your neighbour as you love yourself is the exact opposite of wanting to make another person in your own image. It's robbing a person of what makes them who they are at a fundamental level. Even worse is to make them feel ashamed of the person they've been born to be. I am privileged as a white, straight man. I don't really have to think about my identity. I find it hard to imagine what it must be like to be black in a white world, or gay in a straight world, or a woman in a man's world. It must be terrible to feel that the only way you can succeed in life is to be who you are not, to live as if you were more acceptable than the person you were born to be. That was the case for Onesimus. We don't know how he became a slave, but we do know that as a slave he was robbed of his true identity by his Christian church leader owner Philemon. And Onesimus's best chance of survival was simply giving up on who he was, and becoming the person that Philemon had bought him to be. But that's not the end of the story, because for reasons we don't really know, Philemon has ended up where Paul is in prison, and has gone to see Paul. Who knows, perhaps Paul had visited the church in Philemon's house in the past, and Onesimus had served him there. Whatever the reason, the imprisoned apostle and the enslaved man get into conversation, and Paul manages to help Onesimus understand that a relationship with God is open to him, even him, a slave, through Jesus Christ. In fact, we know that Paul sang hymns when he was in prison, according to Acts, so perhaps Paul sang for Onesimus the hymn in Philippians 2 about Christ coming and taking the form of a slave, dying the death of a slave on the cross, but then being exalted to the highest place with a name above every name, and before this Christ, every knee, including the knee of slave owners, would one day bow. Onesimus, well, he becomes a Christian. Doesn't stop him being a slave, though, and Paul sends Onesimus back to his owner Philemon, and you get the impression that there may not be a very warm welcome when he returns. Onesimus is bringing to Philemon, his owner, a letter in which Paul will say, verse 15, Perhaps this is the reason he was separated from you for a while, so that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother. This verse was significant in the British anti-slavery campaign of the late 18th and early 19th century. This is the campaign that the Anglican evangelical Christian and politician William Wilberforce became famous for. But at a grassroots level, the campaign was supported by the kind of publicity that would be familiar to us nowadays, but which was new in the 1800s. Josiah Wedgwood of Wedgwood Pottery fame produced the first badges – Badges or medallions which signified support for the anti-slavery movement. And they had a picture of a black man in chains, but around the outside were the words based on Paul's letter to Philemon, Am I not a man and a brother? You see, what will the slave owner Philemon see when his slave Enesimus brings him this letter? Which identity is more important to Philemon? Is it that the man standing before him is Onesimus, useful, who has perhaps done wrong, is his slave and should therefore be punished, perhaps by terrible violence or by being sold on as damaged goods? Is that the identity that Philemon will see? Or will he be able to see a deeper identity, the God-given identity that was always there, but, as the great hymn puts it, 
new minted and restored in Christ Jesus. The identity of a fellow believer, more than that, a brother in Christ. How hard would it be for Philemon to acknowledge this new identity? I mean, what would it mean? That Onesimus and Philemon would pray together? That Onesimus and Philemon would listen to the scriptures together? That Onesimus and Philemon would sit down at the same communion table together? Perhaps even with Philemon serving Onesimus with bread and wine? It's a lot to ask. But I think we often forget the harder task, the task that faced Onesimus. Because in the command for Philemon to accept Onesimus as a brother, there is an unwritten but reciprocal command that Onesimus should accept Philemon as a brother. Onesimus has been bought by Philemon, perhaps prodded and poked in the marketplace like a piece of meat. Onesimus has been given a new name and expected to follow his new master's instructions without question and robbed of his family identity. Onesimus has probably been beaten by Philemon, at least, at least at Philemon's command, shouted at, abused and mistreated. Can he really see Philemon as a brother? For both of these men, this letter represents a huge challenge. And for both of these men, the challenge comes from their encounter with Jesus Christ. For Onesimus, there must have been the huge challenge to believe that the Lord Jesus Christ would even accept someone like him. For Philemon, there must have been the huge challenge to think and act differently than the expectations of his society. But for both of them, there was a challenge to live up to their true and deepest identity in God and to accept each other as a brother in Christ. The challenge in our day is to walk the difficult path of identity, not forcing people to deny who they are, nor losing sight of who we are. But for those of us who are Christians, there is a yet deeper challenge. Because for all that I am Manx or English or Welsh or Irish, more than that, I am a Christian. For all that I am gay or straight or bisexual, more than that, I am a Christian. For all that I am a man or a woman or undefined, more than that, I am a Christian. For all that I am black or white or Asian, more than that, I am a Christian. For all that I am slave or free or slaveholder, more than that, I am a Christian. Fundamental to who any of us are is our relationship with our Maker. As Paul says elsewhere, if anyone is in Christ, new creation. We are reminded of who we were made to be, and that needs to shape our thinking. Because I'm not sure what I think about removing statues of slave owners, like the one in uh, Cardiff's City Hall. I think the bigger issue is how people think. In Edinburgh, on the Royal Mile, just in front of St Giles Cathedral, is a famous statue of David Hume, the leading figure of the Scottish Enlightenment in the mid-1700s. He was a towering intellectual and influenced many fields, including economics, politics, science and philosophy. The famous philosopher Immanuel Kant considered Hume to be his inspiration. Local tradition has it that by touching the toe of the statue, it will bring his wisdom and philosophy students have apparently done it for years. Yet despite all his contributions to society, Hume wrote this. I am apt to suspect the Negroes to be naturally inferior to the whites. There never was a civilised nation of any other complexion than white, nor even any individual eminent either in action or speculation. It's one thing to be part of the problem of slavery or of racism or of homophobia or whatever else through our actions. But it's another to be setting up a model of thinking that justifies it. I mean, Christians have not been immune from this. But what was it that motivated Paul's thinking? What was it that motivated this old man in prison writing a letter about a slave to a Christian slave owner? I think it was simply that he understood deeply the significance of the gospel and what it meant for our identity. To take his own words from Galatians. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptised into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. 
There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Please, God, help us to live according to this truth. Amen. There is only one hymn that we can now sing. I'm sure you've already guessed it. Amazing Grace became an anti-slavery and civil rights anthem. It was written by a former slave trader who became a Christian and later a priest, John Newton. He said, It will always be a subject of humiliating reflection to me, that I was once an active instrument in a business at which my heart now shudders. He wrote a pamphlet about the terrible things he witnessed and took part in as a slave trader, and it was sent to every member of Parliament in 1788. By this means, the man who'd captured, shipped and sold slaves contributed to its abolition in Britain. That someone like him could be accepted by God through Christ is, indeed, amazing grace. Saved a wretch like me I once was lost But now I'm found Was blind But now I see T'was grace that taught my heart to sing And grace my fears relieved how precious did that grace appear The hour I first believed My chains are gone, I've been set free My God, my Savior, has ransomed me And like a flood, His mercy reigns an end Thank you for joining us in worship today. We finish with a prayer of the Apostle Paul from prison. This is my prayer. 
that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. And now may the blessing of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, be with us all and all those we love and all those for whom we pray, now and evermore. Amen.